Good afternoon and welcome to Enterprise Works at the University of Illinois Research Park. This is part of our startup week and our series talking about different entrepreneurship help that we can offer to our clients and tenants. This week we heard a lot of stories of success coming out of this building and how to achieve your goals as a startup company. But in the very beginning, there are a lot of fundamentals that have to take place to be able to get your business operational and going and taking it from perhaps a research project or a student project to turning it into a real company. And one of the most important components of that is establishing it as a legal corporation or LLC. And there are often immigration considerations, there are IP considerations. And we've been lucky in the research park for 20 years to be working with one of the attorneys in town that has really developed a specialty in this area, helping many small businesses and entrepreneurs, especially those here in the research park. And that's Alan Singleton. He's also one of our entrepreneurs and residents here in the research park who helps many different companies that have legal questions, whether they've actually formed or not, entrepreneurs go to Alan and ask for advice about how to get a startup going. He also has a team in place to be able to assist with many different business considerations. And today he's gonna to share some of his insights, not only on early stage legal questions, but also new Illinois laws that are important to companies that are already established as well. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Alan Singleton. Thank you, Laura. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to visit today. And uh, as we go along, if you can't hear or something, let me know. And also, uh, if you have questions or comments or more stories, please chime in. I think you can interact with this is very helpful. Um, I actually am starting at the, the last part of my presentation because I think a lot of the planning stuff that you actually get to before you talk to an attorney, putting some thought into stuff and getting in mind the big picture is very important. Uh, keep in mind the big picture. How is this business going to work? Kind of think through, you know, you can talk to an attorney but before you launch, kind of think through, who's my team going to be? You know, right now it may just be you, and you know your skill set, and you have a vision for adding uh, to your team, or it may be a complete team of similarly situated individuals, say two or three startups, or two or three students at the University of Illinois, or it may be a professor at the OI, a postdoc, and an undergraduate student, and a money person. In that case, the team has a number of different hats. Uh, Financial person, somebody with financial insight is, is often a valuable team member. Um, and at least put a little bit of thought into the ownership structure uh, and, and the potential for a investment schedule. Uh, think about whether you want to, uh, a good situation is not to have four people own 25% of the company each with uh, the ability to walk away the next day and not be involved in the business and still keep that 25%. That makes for a very, very awkward situation from an ownership perspective and can basically kill the company. So put a little thought into the potential for people to earn their stock over time. Um, the i program is amazing. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go through the i program, please do. If you don't have the opportunity to go through the i program, think about what they will do in, in the i program. And one of the most important things is they will force you to go out and talk to potential customers to see if, in fact, uh, you have something that somebody is going to write a check for, uh, to pay for. And if that's the case, then, and you believe that you can get that product or service out to the marketplace, then you have a good prospect for a successful company. But you can also build a team and get all, all the other pieces in place. Think a little bit about intellectual property. Um, does a major company have a whole bunch of patents that will keep you from doing what you want to do? Um, do you have uh, a patent that you would like to license from the University of Illinois uh, to, in order to move things forward? Um, and uh, do we have immigration considerations that we need to take into account? Um, so, is there a reason to stay at the university for a period of time on a postdoc, bring the uh, intellectual property a little further along until you can get an immigration piece in place that will allow you to work at the company? And then, at least think about the funding and compensation pathway. Um, 
If you are accustomed to being a student or uh, working on a grad student uh, compensation level, uh, that may be one thing. Uh, if you are in a situation where you uh, have to support a family and are expected to be a significant breadwinner, you'll need to plan into the finances and ability to have a salary at some point, uh, probably a little bit sooner rather than later. You can't plan everything, but at least try to go through those thoughts, those, those, those steps, instead of just saying, waking up and saying, hey, we're four undergrads and we want to form a company. So if you put a little bit of thought into it, you increase the likelihood of success. Um, as we go through this, please do chime in. Um, I think one of the big picture things that is important is that you're going to end up wearing many hats. Um, does anybody in here have kids? Some kids. Uh, I think that most people in here have a job. Does, it, does anybody in here have uh, a volunteer role at an organization? So those are some different hats that you wear. And within an organization, when you start out, it's going to be small, and you're probably going to wear a lot of those hats. Over time, the hats may change. Uh, you may be switched from the CEO and uh, the person who does everything to the CTO. Uh, and, and a part of establishing an organization is establishing a culture, a culture of engagement where people are believe in what the company mission is, respect each other, and try to move forward. All the legal documents that I'm talking about uh, are good, they, they should be in place, but the most important thing is getting that, the significantly important thing is getting that culture in place, that vision in place, so that uh, the legal documents will flow and hopefully stay in uh, you know, a box someplace for the most part because you're enjoying moving the company forward. But here's some stuff that you're going to want, want to think about. You're going to want to set up your entity. That means select a business entity, a corporation, a limited liability company, most likely a corporation. Um, think about protecting your company's intellectual property. Uh, put in place employment agreements so that if employees do generate intellectual property, they're going to be owned. It's going to be owned by the company. Um, think about incentivizing employees with equity compensation. That could be restricted stock, vesting over time, or stock options. Um, and then uh, make sure you comply with immigration law. We have a, an amazing number of resources here available to startups. Try to make the best use of those. And think about what, if any, capital you're going to need to raise and, and move forward with that. Um, these are some common business entities, and uh, you, can, uh, you can follow the slides, but there's also a handout uh, on your table, and the top handout provides an overview uh, at a glance of different business entities. Uh, I kind of find it helpful when I sit down with somebody and we think about, um, we talk about some different factors. Uh, we talk about what are the tax implications for your organization? What type of capital are you going to need? Um, and how that has an effect on things. And then we, we I kind of go through the list and we, we try to arrive at what makes the most sense from your perspective. But anyway, we have sole proprietorships. Uh, that's just you starting to do business on your own. Uh, you do a little bit of consulting work, you get paid a couple thousand dollars, and uh, that's a sole proprietorship. General partnership is you and your buddy uh, get together and start doing some uh, software consulting together. You may not have realized it, but you have formed a general partnership. I have never actually done legal documents to form a general partnership. If you're forming a general partnership, it's probably by default. There's a little bit of personal liability associated with it. And so in general, that's not the right uh, entity choice if you're going to do something fairly formal. Uh, some chapter S corporation is sort of a work course of a corporation of an entity. It's very common for service companies that you might see around town. I, I'm actually organized as a subchapter S corporation. In the past, we organized a lot of um, SBIR uh, funded companies as subchapter S corporations, and sometimes we still do. Um, but there's a reason we tend, I tend to push them to C corporations now. Uh, the, the Delaware C Corporation is the gold standard for a tech company. So if you're going to start a company that's going to commercialize a product, 
that's going to have uh, you know develop a patent portfolio or get some um, or license some technology from the University of Illinois. The Delaware C Corp is going to be the entity of your choice. Um, limited liability company uh, that its tax is a partnership, so it has pass through tax treatment. It's most common if your business is up and going and you want to purchase an office building or build a factory, a lot of times there would be a separate limited liability company to own that. A single member LLC, um, typically that's used in a situation where uh, you want to have a subsidiary or perhaps you're just doing a little bit of consulting on your own and you want to have a limited liability associated with that. Uh, you can form a limited, uh, one owner limited liability company. And then the, the last three are not for profit organizations or hybrids thereof. Um, the first, the next two on the list, low profit LLC and mutual benefit corporation, you don't see a lot of, but occasionally in social entrepreneurship settings, uh, particularly with students at the University of Illinois, I've seen situations where they looked at those. And then not for profit corporation, there are a lot of those around. Uh, some have even had uh, a presence in the University of Illinois Research Park. Okay, again, the factors we looked at look at are uh, limited liability. So, what does that mean? In general, you want to think of this entity that you create as a separate entity, a separate person. The law considers it almost a separate person. Um, and that means that the business debts, in general, are going to stop at the business. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Does anybody know one exception? About taxes. The government creates the notion of limited liability companies and corporations, but if you're the president or CEO and you don't pay the payroll taxes for your company, uh, the IRS and the state of Illinois can, can come out of you personally. So taxes are an exception. If you start doing business under a name other than your own name, uh, or other than, other than the company name, that, that's another exception. So there are a number of formalities that you need to adhere to in order to maintain that liability. But in general, a company, setting up a company with limited liability is, is a good thing and helps protect your personal assets. Income tax implications, there are income tax implications now, and there are income tax implications later. Um, the uh, the pass-through entities, uh, the LLC and the subchapter S corporation, provide for only one level of taxation, so that's a nice thing uh, right now, but the uh, subchapter C corporation provides for a thing called section 1202 small business uh, tax treatment, which can allow you to avoid paying tax on a significant portion of gain in the event that you sell the company later on. So for a DC backed company that's going to attract significant investment dollars, that tax treatment is the compelling feature uh, in what you need to be focused on. Um, ability to raise capital. Uh, VCs and venture capital firms will only invest in a C corporation. So, and most likely only one form of Delaware. Uh, if there's any tech aspect to it, even if you think that you're going to start out as SBIR, I tend to guide people towards a subchapter C corporation so they don't lose that uh, section 1202 treatment. And then finally, credibility in the business world. If you go out to Silicon Valley and ask for funding for your limited liability company, that's not going to get you very far. Okay, we talked a little bit about sole proprietorship. Again, that's just you acting on your own. You're liable for everything, you've got to manage everything, everything gets reported on your individual income tax return. S Corporation, we talked about a little bit. Uh, there, is a, there are a limit of 100 stockholders or owners in a subchapter S Corporation. That's probably not going to be an issue, but the type of owners is a limit, and that can have an effect on investment. So a lot of individuals who are wealthy who might want to make an angel investment will want to invest in their higher rate or perhaps through a limited liability company they've set up to manage family funds. And those are not eligible stockholders in a subchapter S corporation. 
In the past, the University of Illinois would take ownership in the Subchapter S Corporation, and that would not compromise the uh, sub-house treatment. I've heard some discussion uh, recently that uh, they're less willing to do so. Have you heard anything before? Okay. I heard just a little bit of pushback from OTM about sub-house specifically. Uh, basically, the university would end up with unrelated business income if they own stock in the Subchapter S Corporation. It's one more thing they have to keep track of and perhaps pay tax on. Uh, it is fairly easy to switch from an S to a C, and that's a common thing to do, but you can't move back and forth. But again, you, you're probably not going to be eligible for the Section 1202 tax treatment that most significant investors would want to see. The Delaware C Corporation is a gold standard. It provides limited liability for stockholders, for shareholders, even if they participate in management. So that's a good thing. Uh, tax at both the corporate level and the stockholder level. So, gentlemen, the first row. You form your company, you have $100,000 in income that comes in December 25th and no, rep, and, and no expense. Okay, and you have a bill that comes due January 5th and you can't pay it until January 5th of the next year. Do you see any issue with that? You're gonna have to pay tax in, that, in the first year on $100,000 worth of income, right? And then in the next year, you're going to have that expense. So they're not going to sync up. And I see Robert's in the back. He could probably add more insight than I on that. But, um, but it, it can create cash flow problems because revenue and uh, expense don't always sync up in the, in the correct year. A lot of times you're in, a, in a startup company, you're going to have a loss anyway for quite a number of years, so it won't be an issue. But you do really need to think if you are set up as a C corporation about timing of payments and expenses so that you don't get uh, caught up in a difficult situation. Yes? Are there any ways to set that on these tax forms? Is that operating well? Uh, there, there, there are, and they're, they're above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, those are accounting issues. All good questions. You can also be a, a cash fit faces taxpayer, so you pay, you know, in the revenue you, you pay uh, based upon when the money comes in the door. If your cash faces, you can be accrual basis, which means that um, when the when the when the obligation to pay uh, accrues, you, you, in general, that's an expense, and when you're you earn the money, in general, that is income. Uh, most Smaller companies are cash places, and you have to switch to accrual over time. Um, but the, the tax and the accounting is, uh, speaking of which, uh, one of your team members needs to be a good accountant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very important issue. I, the times when I've seen the most stress on a, a stockholder, and this is, you know, in, in, in my first years of practice, I Helped a senior partner out. It was a professor at the U of I 20 plus years ago, so there's no way you can track it. But you know, they they were treating some individuals as uh, independent contractors when, in fact, the IRS believed that they should be uh, employees. And now, and the IRS allowed that to go on for about three years, and then they set on notice, and then did a back on it. And now they're looking, you know, at three to five years worth of payroll taxes to pay on all these individuals. Um, who, in the IRS's mind, should have been treated as uh, employees. So, uh, getting a good accountant and making sure you're following the tax rules, getting those payroll tax returns on file, all that kind of stuff is very, very important. Again, because you need to have a, a good structure where you uh, keep the company healthy and you don't incur, incur any personal liability. Now, yeah. just put a little plug. So, Alan is an entrepreneur in residence here. <laughs> Journey, as he's telling you, we do have other entrepreneurs and residents, and one of them um, is a venture capitalist, Dennis Beard, but he's also an accountant by background. He's helped a lot of companies if you just have accounting questions. You don't want to um, use Dennis's time on one of the EIRs. Robert, raise your hand in the back. Robert's new to our team, works on accounting here. He can answer some basics for you. Roger, who's been here forever. Um, and then they can refer you to other firms in town. So uh, Martin Hood and other good places, Kelly's Accounting and, and others that we work with. So if you need help, ask. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, we talked about a little bit of liability company a little bit. And you most I, I set up very few LLCs for people who might be in this audience right now, unless it was a joint venture, which is two companies getting together uh, to, to, to work on an entity-based joint venture, maybe to develop a particular type of IP in a particular market, or unless uh, a company was buying an office building or, or uh, establishing a factory facility. Um, so the, for, the, for the most part, your primary company that you would try to be trying to commercialize technology in, I would suggest avoiding a limited liability company. This is a little bit about the structure. Uh, LLCs have members, uh, corporations have shareholders or stockholders. In Illinois, they're called shareholders. Delaware uses the term stockholders. They're the owners. So, you know, that's, that's one of the hats, right? So you got one hat, you're an owner, right? Uh, you can have another hat, and that's the somebody on the board of directors, right? And then you can have another hat, which you're an officer. Um, and each of those hats has a little bit of different duties. Uh, maybe that you wear all those hats at the same time. Uh, the officer would be the person who signs the contracts. Uh, the board would not sign a contract. They establish overall policy and elect the officers to then implement that policy. The stockholders or shareholders are the owners, and they elect the board, and, uh, and they get to vote their shares to elect the board. Uh, a stockholder in their own, in that hat, is not going to sign a contract, and you don't want them to have the authority to sign a contract, right? Only if you're also an officer, typically, would you have the authority to sign a contract. One of, the, one of the big things that I see with the startups is that they'll do all the work to set up an entity and then they'll sign, sign an agreement in their own name <laughs> or in some sloppy, sloppy manner so that it's not clear that the contract is actually with the company. So that's one of the basic things. You want to keep in mind which hat you're wearing and then make sure any document that you sign is clearly in the name of the company by you. So for me, it would be Singleton Law Firm by Eleanor Singleton, comma, cousin. So. These are a couple of documents that you would have for a, a, a corporate entity. Think of the bylaws as uh, sort of your, not day to day, but your routine type of services, how you uh, hold a meeting of the stockholders, how you elect the board of directors, uh, what officers uh, are going to be elected and what their duties are and how you elect them. Um, and probably some indemnification provisions that say that the corporation in the event an officer or board member gets sued, uh, the corporation will take care of that liability. So that's sort of the day-to-day, -day, no major transaction type of thing. Stockholder agreement or shareholder agreement um, deals with such things as uh, transfer of stock. So if uh, you and two or three other folks start a company, you don't want uh, one of you to be able to sell the stock to a third party without talking to the others and without perhaps some restrictions. A lot of times the, uh, the stockholder agreement will have drag and tag along rights. So tag along rights means that of your buddies can't sell their stock without also giving you the opportunity to quote tag along in the sale, okay, and participate in the sale so that you don't get left out of the exit. Drag along rights means um, 75 percent of the owners of the stock um, have voted to sell and now they can compel the minority owner to go along with the sale so you don't have a holdout uh, who is holding up a transaction. Um, so tag and drag rights are typically uh, included in, in that. And sometimes the, some other provisions such as, in some circumstances, we include intellectual property ownership provisions in there. It's not appropriate for all uh, stockholder agreements, but there may be situations where, um, for example, folks aren't quite, they're still at the university in a, you know, a postdoc situation, uh, they may think of an idea that is within the company, they're an owner of the company, but they're not actually working for the company, so they don't have a, an employment agreement with the company. And then there would be some provisions in the stockholder agreement to address that. 
Later on, when you get outside investments, uh, I would guess that uh, Illinois Ventures would not really like want to sign a uh, stockholder agreement that says that if uh, uh, Mr. Parkinson invents something while serving on your board, the company is going to own it. Uh, so he'd have fiduciary duties if he's serving on your board, but he wouldn't want to obligate the entire organization to something like that. So that's, that's something that can change over time. LLC operating agreements basically address the same thing. So for the notes, but it's the sister document that replaces both bylaws and the stockholder agreement. We talked a little bit about piercing the corporate veil uh, earlier. I mentioned that. Basically, you've created this separate entity. Uh, make sure that you take advantage of the liability protection it offers. Um, uh, it needs to be appropriately capitalized on setup. In the US, that's pretty easy. Uh, in some of the overseas countries, it's a lot of money. I think I saw in Germany, it depended on the, the different entity you might set up, it's a significant number of dollars. And that's easy to meet in the US. Um, you need to have annual meetings of stockholders and directors. Now, those could be consent minutes. Uh, they don't, you don't necessarily have to meet in person, but you need to have something uh, in writing, uh, documenting the minutes and the meetings. You need to maintain separate financial records, so you shouldn't pay your home mortgage out of the company bank account, for example. And um, and then file annual reports with the Illinois Secretary of State. It's amazing the number of people I talk to and set up and, and like, oh, we have to do an annual report in the corporation's office. Yep, you have to do an annual report in the corporation's office. <laughs> um, and it depends on how many states you're doing business in. If you're Foreman Delaware and you have an office here at Enterprise Works, you're going to need to be authorized to do business in the state of Illinois. If you're Foreman Delaware and you really don't have an outside presence, you're you know moving some tech, trying to move some technology forward. You don't have any employees currently. You may get by as a startup just pouring into Delaware for a bit. Um, if you start hiring employees in California or other states, you really need to become authorized to do business in that in those states because you're going to need to be filing payroll tax returns in those states as well. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about vesting schedules and things of like that later on. Um, let me look at where we are in time. One of the most important things you can think about as you're forming your company is what intellectual property associated with the company. Um, uh, first of all, you know, do you have freedom to operate? Uh, and if you don't have freedom to operate, are you going to be able to get freedom to operate? So are you going to get a license from the holder of intellectual property? Or is there just really no opportunity there because somebody has really blocked your avenue? Uh, and then uh, can you uh, generate some intellectual property or does one of your founders have some intellectual property that can help your company move forward? Sometimes folks just start with an idea and there's no real intellectual property generated and so there's not much of an assignment. Other times there, you know, one of the individuals may have a patent that they already have or an application that they already have. And if others are going to get involved in the company through spending time and investing money, then uh, you should make sure that you secure the rights to that patent uh, within the company. Uh, as you form. And it's always a judgment call, you know, whether that's going to be an assignment or a license. Uh, it depends on, you know, the likelihood of success, you know, what uh, the owner of the patent is willing to negotiate to what the other parties are putting in. Um, so that, that's getting the intellectual property in there to start, and then employment agreements will help you get, maintain that in there at, over time. Uh, initially, if you have any outside consultants, you will want to get assignments of intellectual property from them. So, for example, if you have copyright that is uh, might attach to software that is generated by uh, a, an independent consultant who generates some source code from you, you need to make sure that you get an assignment of that. Just paying the bill, you know, you probably get the right to use it, but you really don't own the copyright on it. So, make sure you get assignment. Here's some ways to protect intellectual property. You know, you flip over the chart. Uh, there's, there's kind of a summary of those as well. Um, the uh, and really the uh, let's see, they go in this situation. The top one is the most expensive. It's the biggest, the most powerful in a lot of ways. 
but it's the most expensive. It costs a lot of money to get a patent, it takes a long time. Uh, in the software arena, a lot of times companies don't get them anymore, sometimes they do. Um, but uh, in, in a medical device company that's going to take a long time to develop, or a pharmaceutical, you probably better have some patent protection uh, because you're going to need something of value to establish that market for you. Don't overlook trademark protection over time. Um, trademarks can last forever. Patents have a finite la lifetime. And if you think about the value associated with brands, uh, oh my gosh, if you get a good brand going, uh, that brand can have real value over time. So think about, uh, as you get your company started, think about those branding aspects and how you can use trademark uh, protection over time. Copyright is uh, an important issue, in particular as it relates to software. Uh, you need to make sure your employees have agreements indicating that you, your company is going to own it. A lot of times you don't register the copyright power uh, because you have to disclose the portion of your source code. Trade secret protection is very important. As you structure your company, if you have 10 employees and two of them are software developers, maybe the president and the two software developers I have access to the source code. The people who are doing the marketing plan, the, the people who, uh, you know, the person who's answering the telephone should not have access to that source code. Uh, you need to try to protect and limit access to the, the trade secret information so that it does not get disclosed. And then finally, contracts, non-disclosure agreements, employment agreements, license agreements, um, joint development agreements, all those types of agreements deal with intellectual property. There are things that you want to think about as you establish your company and build value. We covered that. Uh, the provisional application is something to think about uh, as a startup. If you have uh, an idea or you, that you think may be patentable, you can write up a disclosure Place it on file with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and it holds your place in mind for a year. Establishes your priority date. The more complete the disclosure, the better. Um, but it can be done for minimal cost. Uh, if you do a full and complete disclosure, it can add some value. Uh, I will say that if you, if, you, if you have the funds to get the assistance of an attorney to do that, to help structure it, it will make it a stronger provision. But if you don't have the funds and you're able to write it up, placing it on, on file with USPTO is certainly better than, than not doing anything. Um, securing intellectual property from the University of Illinois. Um, that's changed over the years. Um, when I first started um, in this arena, the Office of uh, Technology Management was very small. And, uh, and didn't have a lot of formalities. It's grown over time. It's much more professional now. They categorize, prioritize, um, are good about seeking protection on intellectual property. Uh, but they also are going to expect some things from you. Uh, if you're a startup, they want to know that you're going to be serious about moving forward. Uh, a lot of times they'll require that you do a, an option uh, to license initially, as opposed to doing a full-blown license, uh, and then uh, once you once you then shift over to a full-blown license, depending on the situation, they may want to take some equity in your company, so some stock ownership in your company, uh, and that can be okay. Um, now, if your company has been up and going for five years and already has an established revenue stream, and you want to license a patent from the University of Illinois, probably you're not going to have to give up any stock in the company to do that because the university would be looking backwards. But if you're a startup and you license in a portfolio of patents from the U of I that's going to serve as the basis for your company, you, you probably will. There are typically two types of equity. One is a dilutable form, meaning that uh, the, the university can get diluted, just like uh, by any additional stock, just like any other owner. The other is a non-dilutable form, meaning that if outside capital comes in uh, through a certain amount, then the university will get extra shares in order to, that their percentage will stay the same. And so in your particular situation, you want to look at the likely pathway forward for your company and figure out what, what works best for you.
again, the university is going to want to see a, a commercialization plan. They want to see that you're going to move forward with the uh, technology and not sit on it. So those are some of the things that you might see uh, in that. Okay, employment agreements uh, have changed a little bit. Uh, we have a new law, and there's a handout on I think most of your tables. I may not have had enough for all of them, although I see a couple up front. I guess this is kind of like church. Nobody wants to sit too close. But uh, the uh, uh, there's a new law, and so I think it, in a lot of ways it's a good law, but it places limits on uh, a thing called non-competition provisions and non-solicit provisions. So um, there are sort of three broad types of restrictions and an employment agreement that are intended to protect an employer in terms of intellectual property. One is you can't just disclose information. So if you do get access to the source code, you're not allowed to go publish that or give it out to third parties. That's not really affected by this law, okay? The other, is, another is non-solicit. So that means that you can't, you can't go out and solicit customers of the company or, uh, or employees of the company. Ask them to go to a different company and, and start, you know, at your new employer, hey, my new company is hiring software people, we'd love to have you join, right? That would be a solicitation of, of an employee. And then non-competition. Uh, the, the most classic case of that is if you think about a physician at one practice in town who has a big portfolio of patients, a family practice physician, for example, would go across town and, and work at the competing uh, practice in town. And most of those patients would tend to follow uh, that, that individual. Other times, it may be a very specialized knowledge. There are really only two hobby companies in town, like the big war in the past, and you had access to the secret information and plans of hobby company A, and you were very high level, they might ask for a non-compete from you because they don't want you to go working for hobby company B and disclose the secret. Because there, there's kind of an inevitable disclosure doctrine, which means that you can't get that information out of your mind. And you're, you're going to implement that when you go to company B. Um, so there's some restrictions on that. I think the, the worst type of non-compete happened sort of with the local food uh, franchise where they were restricting delivery drivers <laughs> with a non-compete saying if you deliver for company A, you can't uh, put it to go deliver for company B, which is ridiculous, right? Uh, so people ought to be able to earn a living. Uh, and so there are limits on these non-competes. There were always limits. The, the, that non-compete that I mentioned would have never been enforceable anyway. Um, but there are changes to the law that are a little bit more favorable to employees. Um, the covenant not, not to compete only applies to an employee, can apply to an employee if the employee makes $75,000 or more per year. So that's going to rule out uh, a lot of employees that start up companies. Uh, the covenant not to solicit is the $45,000 threshold. Um, so that's a little bit lower, uh, but there's still a significant threshold there. One of the things that you want to think about is also there needs to be, in order to make either of those enforceable, you need to have adequate consideration, separate consideration for that non compete or non solicit. So I think the trend will likely be that you will have a base employment agreement and there will be a separate non-solicit or non-compete agreement and then you'll make sure you write a separate check, give out a separate award of stock or stock options that will uh, serve as the basis for that. The effective date of the law is uh, the 1st of January of this year, but it is not retroactive. So it does not, you don't have to go back and redo your old employment agreements, but if you have new employment, employment agreements that are getting ready to be in place, you need to think about those issues. Uh, there are some provisions for the Attorney General to enforce it. I find it highly unlikely that the Attorney General would come after a small tech company. I think those are designed more for a large company who might be trying to aggressively circumvent these restrictions. Immigration law, uh, 
Um, nobody wants to get in trouble uh, for improperly working in the U.S. or employing somebody uh, improperly in the U.S. Uh, there, it can be a significant issue. I think a lot of times a very small tech company is, is not highest on the priority list, but to, depending on the winds of change and, and things, you can uh, you can get in a situation where you as an owner are, uh, have created some difficult situations for yourself, but you can also create some baggage for employees in terms of future employment or future immigration. And you don't want to create a situation where you uh, have um, created some baggage for prior, uh, current individuals that will affect them the rest of their lives. Um, you can form a company in the United States even if you can't work in the United States, even if you're not legally able to work in the U.S. So you form a company, you buy an apartment building and somebody else manages it, that's not a problem. You form a company, assign a patent that you invented and have, have in your ownership, and you're an owner, that's not working in the U.S. And you can do that. When you start working for the company, however, then you're working in the U.S. and you need to have legal authorization to work. Um, one of the things to think about, and it's, it's sometimes a difficult issue for students at the University of Illinois who are participating in the, in the, in the business plan competitions, they'll list themselves as CEO, chief technical officer, you know, lead um, scientific officer, et cetera, et cetera, on their LinkedIn profile, and the company hasn't been formed yet. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if you go out of the country and then you try to come back, um, you know, it, it could be a difficult situation and discussion upon re-entry. Um, it can also be difficult to, to bring that, take that information back. So maybe you resign from those positions when you actually form the company, uh, but uh, the officer looking on the internet uh, will see those types of things and it can be awkward. So uh, try to avoid, if you are not legally able to work, if you're on a company, listing yourself publicly in a way that's going to cause difficulties on re-entry. Um, there's a, a handout for uh, legal pathways to work uh, in the U.S. and sort of immigration at a glance on your table, and uh, I won't go through it in detail, but basically the first slide, uh, F1, CPT, OPT, STEM extension, uh, the university office uh, will help the student with that, and you as an employer need to cooperate in that process, but you do not need an attorney Unless you just want to brainstorm on some strategies to help with that. Uh, you flip it over, and we have a magical date coming up. Uh, March 1 to March 20. March 1 to March 20 is the window for entering the lottery for the H-1B. And so if you have individuals working on you know, OPT that you want to uh, get entered in that lottery, now is the time to start getting that paperwork in order. And I think uh, no, not the 20th, it's the 18th, sorry, the 18th. And I think the 18th ends at noon Eastern time. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> so early is better than later. So it's the 18th uh, at noon. Early is better than later. There we go. Uh, March 1 through March 18th. That'll vary each year. So uh, just the last, last couple of years, it's been in March, so you need to check each year. It's a lottery, you don't always get pets. A lot of times it's better, better to enter early and often uh, because sometimes you can get more than one application in, uh, particularly if you can get a STEM extension on your OPT. All right, a little bit about equity compensation. Um, stock options and restricted stock. Uh, that's really the two main tools that you'll see. Early on uh, in the life of the company, the restricted stock is the way most uh, individuals get stock ownership. Even if you're a founder, most of the time you will get restricted stock, which means that um, you have to earn your stock over time. So if there are three founders and they one of them leaves uh, early, then they forfeit a portion of their stock. That's typical. Um, one of the most important things, if you do get issued restricted stock, you want to make sure you file your e 3 d election within 30 days. Uh, if you blow that 30 day election, there's really no way to make it up. Uh, the reason you want to file that is you want to establish that as 
income is U and the year of it's given. So when the stock isn't worth much, you want to pay income tax on that and you want to report it to the IRS. Um, and then you've established that you're the owner of it. Any appreciation in that stock would then be a capital gain and you wouldn't have to pay uh, wait, uh, tax on wages on your appreciation in that stock. When the value of the company increases over time, say you get a funding round or you get significant revenue, then uh, you really need to shift away from issuing restricted stock to issuing stock options. And that needs to be done pursuant to a qualified stock option plan. Um, an option to purchase stock is um, issued at then current fair market value. So if the fair market value of the share is ten dollars, the employee would have the right to uh, exercise that option, pay the ten dollars, and then they would become the owner of the stock. Most of the time, employees don't exercise the option unless and until the company exits. Uh, so it's typically a cashless exercise. Um, there are some limits on how you go about doing that. Um, options issued to employees are a little bit different than an option issued to a, an independent consultant. There's a little bit of different tax treatment. Uh, but certainly issuing options needs to be pursuant to a qualified stock option plan. And the first time or two you do those, you need to make sure uh, you seek the advice of an attorney to help you make sure you're complying with all the rules relating to fair market value determination and such. And in stock and stock appreciation rights uh, really are seldom used, and those are available, but they're available for other types of entities such as LLCs. Options are typically also subject to a vesting schedule. So, new hire, you think they're going to be there for three years at least. The grant would vest over a three-year period, and there'll probably be a one-year growth. So they don't get a, they don't get to keep any of their options if they don't stay there at least a year. And then typically they would need to exercise the options if they leave. They have a certain window after they leave to exercise the options. The idea is that you don't want to pay them backwards to the value that's already been established in the company, but you want to incentivize them to assist with the growth. Of A lot of great resources to help. Uh, we've got the IR program, Enterprise Works has a, a, so many resources available. Uh, Illinois Ventures is here. There's another venture capital firm in town, Sarah Ventures. ICOR, I highly recommend if you get to participate. Oh, I think I'll close right there, other than to say that uh, there have been a couple of changes in. Um, in how early stage funding happens with respect to uh, convertible notes versus safes. Uh, five, ten years ago, almost always it would be a convertible note um, that would start out before a price round. Uh, that would be an obligation to repay, okay? And, and you have to repay that. Now, most of the time, people wouldn't call in a convertible note if the company didn't have the cash, but it is an obligation to repay. Uh, over time, Y Combinator came out with a simple safe. Uh, now they've come out with three additional versions. Uh, so when you think about filling out a simple safe, you need to think about uh, which version you're filling out. And one of the most important things I would say is you really need to start part of the planning process starts in Excel. You need to get an Excel cap table, an Excel spreadsheet that says, okay, here are our three stockholders. Yeah, we're going to set aside so much for options for future employees. And we think we're going to grow the value of the company to a million dollars. And then we're going to take in X number of dollars of investment. And that's going to dilute us from, you know, basically a third ownership each down to 25% ownership each. And then you need to think about the next round. What's the value of the company you need to get to uh, so that you end up with an in in the slice of the pie that is acceptable to you. Uh, hopefully you can grow the value of the pie, so each time you give away a slice, uh, you have to give away a smaller percentage. Um, but that process and planning, I think one of the most important things you can do is keep a current cap table, think about where you are, where you want to be, uh, what milestones you need to reach in order to uh, keep the company going from a funding perspective. Does anybody have any questions? I 
I've seen go wrong, okay, are, you know, four individuals starting a company and each of them thinks that they own half of it. And then they go on for a year doing that. I actually started to do a slide on when's the right time to start a company, right? And sometimes you want to wait for immigration law purposes. Sometimes you want to, uh, you know, get started early because you want to get the, the process started for that five-year period for Section 1202 treatment or Get your vesting schedule started before you take VC money because they want to see you've done that. But I would say, you know, the worst things that I've seen are when people thought they had a team and they didn't have a team. Um, and sometimes it's because they didn't put in force basically the foundation, set up a company, and they work for a year. And, you know, all of a sudden now they you have three people who each stick, they own half the company. And we've got a problem. Um, one of the things people sometimes suggest is a founder's agreement. Uh, I, I think that's a great idea. I would love to double the amount of legal work that I can do. Uh, doing a founder's agreement, that's a joke. Um, a founder's agreement is basically doing the things that you would do to set up a company uh, from a legal perspective, uh, although it's in a shorter form. So uh, sometimes if a group of students get together and they're working on some sort of software thing, they do a founder's agreement. I think most of the time it's better just to do the planning. Uh, it's like a term sheet before a venture capital round or a term sheet before a sale of a company. These are our business terms that we're working on, and we're going to try to get to a finish. And the finish is setting up the company. And if you have that non binding term sheet, uh, which is you know, the things that would be addressed in the founder's agreement, 
And then you can get to where you have that good team atmosphere, that engagement, or you're moving forward, and you form a company that provides a solid foundation. So I would say that the, the, a lot of the big issues that I see kill a company are the team members are not on the same page early on, and, uh, and they're not engaged. Alan, can you elaborate a little bit more since it's student startup season around campus? There are these companies that are non companies and they're all pictured on a, a web page somewhere saying they're a name of company. And then somebody graduates and they take a job and they're out. What are some of the ways you just were kind of describing this to legally structure that to help maybe the founders agreement? And what are some of the pain points if they don't do it right and how it has to get fixed later? Yeah, I, one of the biggest, worst things that can happen are, you know, they, they set up a company where everybody owns their stock outright, okay, and there's no busing schedule. So two of them go up to Silicon Valley, get a job, the other two are in town, you know, delivering pizzas, trying to generate funding to keep the company going. That company is probably going to fail because we're in a situation now where, you know, why work hard? You know, to, to make these other guys rich when they're already getting rich in Silicon Valley and they're not contributing to the company. Maybe they have non competes or not, no moonlight clause where they can't moonlight at all. Um, so, so that's an issue. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the immigration issue uh, plays a significant role. Um, so many of our participants in the business community do have immigration law issues. We bring the, the best and the brightest from all over the world. Uh, and that's a good thing. But uh, figuring out that integration law dance is something that people have to keep in mind. Uh, one of the things that, you know, ownership of intellectual property is an issue. I see, um, you know, 33 people contributing to the source code, and I meet with individuals and I say, where did this come from? <laughs> well, 33 different people. <laughs> did you get IP assignments from it? You know? Um, you know, what entity owns that IP? Maybe we don't know. You know, maybe we have to start over, maybe we generate, you know, a new code. Uh, use of open source software and not thinking about the copyleft provisions in it, that's a big issue that I see. Um, you know, uh, I, I think one of the things that pushes you to forming a company early er, uh, is if you win codes that, you have to have an entity in place to accept the funds. So. One more question? Yeah, I have a question uh, about IP. Uh, so, uh, let's say a uh, uh, non machine learning person, this is really my word, uh, if there's a data set that is not a commercial data set, so let's say Creative Commons, not a um, can you train like a machine learning model or a sort of program and use that commercial data? Uh, it would depend on the terms that you use that data set under. So there should be terms and conditions that would spell out what you can do with any core product, or at least if there are no restrictions, then you would be fine using it. Uh, you know, that, that algorithm or whatever you develop would be yours. But if, if using that, then you have to be aware of those. I think I'll break now, and uh, thank you everybody for the opportunity to visit. I'll stay after for a while, uh, and my contact information is available uh, if you have any further questions. Thank you.